Yep. Okay, madam. Live also. Just another. Thank you. Thank you. Start yeah. Okay. All right, I seem to be live. It somehow seems to take me five minutes to just come online when I'm not doing it from the conventional place. Sorry, please bear with me. So good afternoon and welcome back. I'm sorry, yesterday I believe uh, the last 10 minutes when I was speaking, I did not know that I was off the hotspot. Then I got the feedback from the principal's office. I apologize. I will continue where uh, the video stopped. We'll finish that lesson and then I will start the second one. Try to finish as much of it as I can by 3.30. And then we'll catch up tomorrow so that then we'll be up to date with the syllabus. So uh, let me just get into my PPT. So we stopped yesterday at the terminology which we were using for the body parts, for their body surfaces and perspectives and sections. I'll just go on to the um, full um, screen mode and uh, we'll continue where we left off yesterday. So, right. So what we've got here is the anterior surface of the body, which you're seeing the lower limbs, and you're seeing we had already talked about the aspects: anterior, posterior, superior, inferior, left lateral, and right lateral. Then we had talked about the different pairs of adjectives we use for whether it's closer to the core or the attachment point or distal. And when we said it was uh, towards the midline or away from the midline, towards the anterior aspect or towards the posterior aspect, and in a transverse section, we could say medial lateral or anterior posterior at the periphery of the structure. But you would be looking at the body in horizontal cuts, which is very, very important for radiological diagnosis. So it is a cross-sectional view, which is one way of learning anatomy. Now, I'd finished this picture, I think. Okay, let me repeat it for the sake of the class. So we had said that we could cut the body in three planes and we would then get different views of a living anatomy structure when the patient is alive and put into a diagnostic machine to be able to get a spot picture of the status of his internal and external structures. When we are doing the surgical approach, it is from surface to deep. There are, there's going to be no cutting into slices. So there, there are certain adjectives which will be more useful to us than to imagine the living person. So this is the basis by which we do a cadaveric approach because that is the surface to deep which we do on a dead person's physical remains, which are very, very, very similar to what he was in life and which is translatable to what you will find in life in your patients next year. But in the meantime, you must remember that death causes certain changes, certain shrinkages, certain discolorations, and this will impact what you actually get to see in the cadaver during first year, which will be different from the way live tissue looks and appears and feels to your touch next year but we will try to do this and that alternatively so that you will get a better perspective on each so we had done this in the last class and i'm proceeding to the next picture so that we will complete the extra thing in this picture is the things which happen with the lower part of the leg below the knee so we said here, when we're doing the thigh, flexion is an anterior movement of the anterior aspect of the thigh against the anterior aspect of the abdominal wall. That means this plane versus from here upwards towards the umbilicus. If they bend towards each other, then we call it flexion of the lower limb at the hip. Whereas if it bends away in the opposite direction where the buttock skin or surface is approximated to the back of the thigh skin or surface, then we call it extension of this joint which is the hip joint this makes sense it is it is relatable even at the upper limb but when it comes to the below the knee portion we see that extension of the knee joint is when you're standing erect and bearing weight upon it which means that it is looking like 
where the anterior aspect or the ventral aspect isn't that what we called it this ventral aspect of thigh is coming closer to the ventral aspect of the lower leg and that should have been a extension word the word should have been extension but it isn't here we are saying extension is when the knee is straight and locked and flexion is when the knee is bent now why did we do that these movements started when this little fetus or embryo was being formed in the uterus and at that time developmentally both upper limbs and both lower limbs were of a similar nature of attachment to the core or the torso the thoraco abdominal body wall of the little developing baby at that time both the ventral aspects of the entire upper limb and that is the proximal part and the distal part as well as a ventral aspect of the entire lower limb again proximal part and distal part were similarly attached to the torso but when development progressed that attachment rotated 90 degrees in two opposite directions for the up shoulder region and for the hip region so the surfaces came to lie exactly on the opposite side or came to face the opposite side for the upper limb and the lower limb this has happened to the limb but the terminology of which aspect is ventral and which aspect is dorsal continue for the sake of continuity of that body part and therefore this surface is still continuing to be called dorsal though the rotation of the limb has happened and that surface which is originally ventral but now is facing backward is still called ventral so you have this little bit of a confusion terminology but it is internationally common in modern medicine parlance or or in nomenclature and therefore we all have to respect it and learn it and master it so that we will not get confused or make any mistakes just remember extension at the knee is the fully locked standing position and flexion is at the fully bent position the adduction abduction is the same as we do in the upper limb the lateral rotation and medial rotation is the same as we do in the upper limb. The proximally distally is the same terminology which I explained yesterday. We said for the upper limb we had a pair of movements called supination and pronation where pronation is when the palm of your hand is facing posteriorly and supination is a normal anatomical position where the thumbs of the palms are most laterally placed. These terminologies are used only in certain areas at certain joint movements not all over the body but you must get used to the words which is why we're teaching it to you all together in one place the extra thing which happens at the foot again as you can see the foot part of your body is at right angles to the leg part of your body which is not the case with the upper limb so the foot part has a medial border which is the big toe side and a lateral border which is the little toe side which are right on the ground that means they are on the same plane as the ground and therefore that edge medial edge can be moved towards the sky that is up superiorly right and that movement is called inversion whereas if the lateral edge is moved up the weight is taken on the big toe and the lateral edge is free and and uh, angled up then that is called eversion so it's a pair of words again a terminology which you must remember which we use here and we also use for the eyeball uh, or, or in other places we use this pair of words inversion and eversion and all that and we will talk about that in those specific places if there are new terms coming up which are only very niche only specific to very small parts those new terms will come up at that time but this generic pairing of terms and orientation to services and views perspectives is important for you to get right from day one so this is as far as the terminology is concerned new pairs of words also will be introduced to you external and internal it's not new you've used it before and it means outer and inner and it might relate to hollow organs or to body cavities or to even in the cuboid of the body to the surfaces relative to each other and we will see as it goes transverse is a word we already used for one of the planes right the green one which went horizontal another word for it is transaxial they drop the trans and most radiologists will use the word only axial they won't use the word transverse at all so when they say axial cut or axial plane they mean at the transverse axis actually sagittal and coronal are also axis but when we use it clinically 
then axial means transverse section. Superficial deep, this is easy enough to understand. It is simple English. Superficial is closer to the surface or the skin. Deep is away from the surface or the skin. Ipsi lateral. Ipsi means same. Lateral means side. So ipsi lateral is the same side. Contralateral is the opposite side. So if I'm talking about contralateral limbs, I'm saying left upper limb, right lower limb or right upper limb, left lower limb and so on and so forth. This works for paired symmetrical structures usually but if we can even use it for asymmetrical structures usually we use it for structures which are paired in the body bilateral is it exists on both sides for example your you your two kidneys or your kidneys are a paired organ and have a bilateral location they, there is on the left side and on the right side if things are happening together parallelly at certain paired structures then the word bilateral becomes very important for example when you're opening your mouth your both your temporomandibular joints are acting together they're two completely separate structures separated by about six inches so that's a bilateral movement we won't use that word for movement but you you get the concept that bilateral means placed in both halves on both sides of the body Protraction retraction is a movement term, it's a pair of terms. It happens at the for the mandible and it happens also for the scapulae bones. At that time we will describe it further in detail. So protraction is projection forward, retraction is returning back to the anatomical position. So I think we had I'd already talked to you about this in the first class, just a quick repeat. What was anatomy? What were the ways in which we are going to teach you anatomy? This different subsets of the subject. And the fact that we are going to concentrate a lot on what we call surgical or applied anatomy and touch on the allied subspecialities. All right, so I'll close this PPT and we will go on to today's class. Now, since we had finished the intro, uh, where we talked about uh, how you're going to name things or rather how you're going to uh, remember the names which have already been given to things you will need to do a lot of reading if you are not from an, a strong English background so those who are from the vernacular and regional languages will have to put in a little extra effort and my strong recommendation is you do it at this time rather than wait to undo or to do it again later so before I launch into the second topic, what I had wanted to finish and I've got some mails and messages from other people is they wanted a look at our book list, uh, what, what books to buy to be able to start with your study. So that's a good thing to tell you now. But you must remember that the curriculum has changed as of 2018 and your senior batch is already doing what is called the CBMA curriculum. So I hope all of you can see the screen. already maximized this is a publication by the Medical Council of India which is called competency based undergraduate medical curriculum for what we are trying to create out of you is the Indian medical graduate I'm sure somebody uh, principal sir or one of the other faculty vice principals has already touched upon this and described it to you this is a publication it is available it's a public domain publication it will be available on your university website and also in the National Medical Commission website the NCI no longer exists it's been completely replaced by a new body a governing body which is a regulator for medical education and, and medical and health services in India and this body is going to implement this curriculum it has been advised to all the apex health universities and to all the medical schools whatever wherever they are teaching mbbs across india they're going to be almost 600 medical schools by next year or 24 22 yes next year so all graduates of these medical schools will become what we are calling the indian medical graduate you will become that in four and a half years time by the grace of god and if you work hard enough and you get through all your 23 subjects and arrive at your internship program so this is just a little picture to demonstrate what it is we are supposed to now also concentrate apart from your knowledge we teachers faculty 
have to also ensure that your skills are up to speed, your attitude is appropriately groomed and mentored and prepared for patient service, your values are reinforced and laid down strongly, your responsiveness is encouraged and measured and certified, and your communication skills are taught to you for those who don't have it and for those who have it, again, it is encouraged and mentored and we will test for it in the exams and then only your certificate of MBBS will be given. So in the light of that, the books which are being published by all the publication houses are also evolving. They've also become uh, better books in the sense that the authors who wrote them have oriented their writings to this new CBME curriculum. So we will Uh, I will share this to the Vice Principal Sir so that he can put it up on the uh, website. The list of books recommended for first year medical students. So like I had already told you, the, the subsets of anatomy are gross, then embryology, genetics, histology and so on. So for gross anatomy, we recommend that the practical be done with a Cunningham's Manual of Practical Anatomy, but there is a single volume one called Grant's Dissector, an excellent book. And use the latest editions only, again, we put mandatory and latest editions because those are the ones which give you efficient knowledge without you having to do double, triple work. So we're trying to make your time uh, more ergonomic so that less effort and less time is consumed but you still get the same amount of material. It requires you to focus and to concentrate and to apply yourself. So this first book runs is that is good. Then there is a Indra Beer Singh's textbook of anatomy uh, which is excellent. There are other authors who also created such textbooks of anatomy in three or four volumes are Dr. Chaurasia or Dr. Vishram Singh. They are also uh, doable. Uh, clinical ori clinically Oriented Anatomy for Medical Students by Richard Snell is an excellent book and uh, is very important now for the new curriculum. Uh, a Medical Dictionary, I had already me mentioned it. I'm sorry, this is a wrong spelling. It's Dorland, D-O-R. Can I do this? I think I can do this. I don't, I'm not able to edit it right now. But uh, please see the medical dictionary's name is Steadman's Dictionary or Dorland Pocket Dictionary. Then for neuroanatomy, which is a subset of Gross, uh, Indra B. Singh's Neuroanatomy or again Vishram Singh or Snell's Clinical Neuroanatomy. It's a little more expensive book. It's a Western publication. So the Indian authors ones are pretty good and uh, probably easier for those who have a difficult challenge with English. Uh, but uh, this is the order of priority. For embryology, we recommend Langman's Medical Embryology, new edition. Or there is, by Dr. Indibir Singh again, there is a title called Human Embryology. So he's written Neuroanatomy, he's also written Textbook of Anatomy. So our, our Doin uh, teachers, he's no longer, he's no more, he passed away a few years back. They had the energy and the enthusiasm to write these books in the service of their students. So we have one in embryology by him, but the stand, the, the what should we say, the reference, the gold standard book is Langman's Medical Embryology. Genetics will come later. Uh, there's an excellent book called Emery's Elements of Medical Genetics, but nowadays is used more like a PG book. Uh, Gangane's Human Genetics is quite good. Then we have DeFayor's Atlas of Histology. Again, uh, I, I don't like to use the word mandatory because I think all students should have a free choice. But some titles are so well put together that once you have them, you won't need anything else. So that's why we, we just noted it like that. Again, Dr. Indabir Singh's textbook of histology is very good. And there is a practical manual by a younger author called Dr. Balakrishna Shetty and Sweekrita. This is very useful to have because it immediately teaches you how to draw your record work. So I won't call it mandatory, but it's a, I strongly recommend it. General anatomy uh, is what you are going to start with. Today's class, we will start with the with approaching anatomy in a format of systems, an overview of systems. So there is a there is a textbook of general anatomy by Dr. Subhadra Revi, and there is another one called Radiological and Surface Marking by Dr. Halim. This is a very old book, 
I don't know which edition of it is available nowadays, but if it's available in some format, please buy it, it will be very useful. Uh, this, this is what you will start with first, general anatomy, so uh, get those titles before you get others. Uh, reference books, of course, everyone has heard of Gray's Anatomy. The latest edition, if I'm not mistaken, is 44th. Please check. There is a student edition and there is a full edition. For those of you who can afford it, it's a thick, fat book and it's expensive. If you think you would like to have it in your library and you would go back to refer to it as a senior student, it's worth doing. Otherwise, before you jump in and buy uh, reference books, it's good if you attend your medical college library explore and see for yourself these books very often sometimes the style of a of an author appeals to you as soon as you read it or not or it doesn't appeal to you it looks dry it looks too uh, you know uh, serious boring whatever so you read two three authors just flip through some pages get a sense of it there's no hurry but take a decision and commit yourself to say any one author who appeals to you and then really jump in and get through because I'll be going at a fast speed. We have a lot of work to cover and you will have to keep up with that speed. Then there is another excellent book called Grant's Method of Anatomy and it comes with a Grant's Atlas. I mean, they're two companion volumes. So this is a, an atlas of gross anatomy dissection. Similarly, there's an excellent Netter's Atlas of Dissection. Again, the cost will probably be an important factor in what you choose. So go to, the idea is you can go to a bookshop, ask for all of them, look through a bit, spend a little time and then make a choice according to how it appeals to you, how heavy it is, um, how much effort you think it will cost you and also how much money it will cost your parents. But reference books are, are good. If you intend to spend a lot of time in the library, it's probably not required to buy the reference books. Make sure you spend that time in the library. But the others you will need to own because you'll be carrying it around, you'll be referring to it, you might want to write some notes, extra points into it. So please do buy books of gross anatomy, histology and embryology for yourself. Apart from that, there'll be a histology record book, a gross anatomy record book. I think there are two volumes. Then there is an instruments kit, there is a lab coat. Anatomy has two labs, gross anatomy and histology labs, and you cannot enter them without coats, so please buy them. A bone set is strongly recommended. Our uh, anatomy staff can make it available to you. Color pencils, they're all available on campus. Um, there will be histology slides and microscopes you'll be utilizing in the lab laboratory. So uh, you'll have to be careful with it. Uh, students are required to maintain long notebooks for slip tests and assignments, but our exam format is going to change. So it's, it's anyway a good idea to buy a few long notebooks to, to write notes. But at the time when we tell you, you please submit them as your test books. And that's what we will use for your formative evaluations. Uh, all of you must be decently formally dressed. Yeah, this, we, this, this list we made several years ago and I haven't changed it. Uh, but essentially, please live up to the respect of who you're going to be. And therefore, behave, dress, speak, carry yourself in a respect-worthy manner. If you don't carry respect in your hearts for your teachers or for your college or for the premises, that's not so critical. But you must respect what you have committed yourself to. And then you must carry yourself that way. You must speak clean, of course, because you have to demonstrate hygiene to everybody who observes you and everybody who will take advice and prescriptions from you. And you must demonstrate decorum, which means appear to your to the person you're serving in a way that that person will receive the service from you if you're going to look like a 16 year old teenager to a patient who's three four times your age and asking you for help with his pain with his problem with his embarrassment with his dysfunction with his fear of death you have to look the part. It's not play acting. It is allowing yourself to grow into the adult which will be required, the kind of adult who will be required to offer advice and service, healthcare service. So please tie your hair, clip your nails, 
wear good clothes. It's not a fancy dress party. It's certainly not a, what do, you, what do you all call that, catwalk. You all are scientific, scientists in the making. But you don't have to be nerds. You can be smart. You can be attractive. But first and foremost, you must be respectworthy. So please live up to that. All right. And your behavior, once you get here on campus, we will monitor that. So as far as this is concerned, I will um, share it. Uh, I'll give it to somebody to share on the website. And uh, I'm done with it for the time being. Now, let us get into class number two. Are we ready? Let's start systemic anatomy. All right. We said that we could teach anatomy or learn anatomy regionally. That means the head and neck region or the upper limb region or the thorax region or the pelvis region and so on and so forth. Or we could learn anatomy in a systematized fashion, which is how it was taught earlier to me as a postgraduate student, for example, or actually is still being taught in a systemic way, in a systemic approach in many parts of the Western medical education. There is no better or worse, but it's good to have a grip of overall view before you get into the regional surgical or applied or clinical approach which is what we do in the practicals so the first system we are going to try to revise i'm saying revise because in your plus two syllabus whether you've come from o and a levels abroad or you've come from the state syllabus of plus two intermediate boards or you've come from cbse 12th grade or isc 12th grade a good amount of human anatomy has already been covered for you so you probably already know much of the terminology and much of the structure names and much of the functions also. But now your perspective has to become sharper because if anything goes wrong with those structures which you learned, you have to be able to heal them. So you need a mastery over the subject and therefore we will go deep and we will go into details and we will learn those details as audio visual knowledge which we will take as classes and you will read in the books but also as psychomotor knowledge because you'll get your hands in and you will actually feel the textures and the, and the surfaces and get a, a whole bunch of other information which no other course provides you except MBBS or the medical courses so let's look at the musculoskeletal system first and here we are not looking at regions but at the whole system how it works together and we'll start with bones bones all together all of them together form the skeletal system which we divide into the axial skeleton where the bones which are in the central axis of the body are included in that and the appendicular skeleton which is where the limb bones are included that means the upper limb and the lower limb which are not in the midline of the body but are attached to the axial skeleton these are the anterior or ventral view and the posterior or dorsal view of the entire skeletal system together in one picture right so you have the skull bones you have the neck bones you have the thorax bones you have the upper limb bones you have the abdominal pelvic bones then you have the lower limb bones all the way down and they are sequenced most of you know all the names you you've done this in the entrance exam but we will still teach it to you in painstaking detail we classify them regionally already we said axial and appendicular we classify them further again regionally into skull area vertebrae, vertebrae and ribs Vertebrae extend from below the skull all the way to the tailbone or coccyx. Ribs extend only in the sternal region. Sternum is also, I'm sorry, ribs only extend in the thoracic region and so does the sternum. So all these together are equal to the axial bones. Of these, in the skull, though it looks like one piece, it is made up of one movable jaw or mandible and a whole bunch of other bones which are fused together to form the cranial cavity and the facial skeleton. So the skull 
consists of this closed bone box called the cranium and a, another bunch of inter interrelated or articulated bones called the face and all together there are about 22 bones in number. Then you have three little auditory ossicles in each side of your ear, so there are six of them, and one unpaired bone called the hyoid in the front of your throat. Right? So these together are going to form your skull. Then there are 26 vertebrae, the 24 ribs, that is 12 pairs, and there is one sternum. So these all together is equal to your axial bones. Then we have our appendicular bones, which belong only to the limbs, which is your upper limb and lower limb. So your upper limb with the shoulder girdle, that means the, the clavicle in the front and the scapula at the back together, which are going to suspend the upper limb from the thorax. And then you have the free bones of the upper limb which are the upper arm, forearm, wrist, arm and finger bones. All together there are 64 of them. Then you have the lower limb which are about 62 bones including the girdle and the free bones and all together everybody knows this general knowledge point is 206 bones but a few of us may have a few extra or one or two less depending on whether in the formation of those bones some fused together more than they should have or stayed apart and therefore became more bones than the average number. So those interesting aspects, variations, exceptions, special situations we will talk about as and when we proceed. So that's this is just basically naming a few. There's a skull, the humerus is the bone of the upper arm, scapula is your shoulder blade, ribs is what houses your heart and lungs. Allah is the medial bone of your forearm re region and radius is the lateral bone. The pelvis is this uh, basin looking structure which has a, a high outward flat part and a narrowing more perforated uh, down part altogether called the articulated pelvis and it has a piece of vertebral fused in between it called the sacrum. Then femur is a long bone of the thigh <coughs> tibia and fibula are the long bones of the leg. With this huge variety of bones that we have, we could have classified it in many, many ways, which is an interesting thing. We must respect those who went before us who figured this out. If you want to classify it by shape, then we have six basic shapes, more or less, by which we can say a bone is either a long bone or a short bone or a flat bone. Or an irregular bone. Sesamoid is like a seed, seed shaped. So till now we are in shape and pneumatic is not really shaped because pneumatic means containing air so it means hollow. So in one way that's also a shape word, right? So if we look at the shape of a bone and put it into a classification it will fit into one of these six. If we look at the internal architecture of the bone, if we slice it and see how what it is made up of inside, what is the pattern, what is the, what is the uh, design of it inside, then there are only two ways it can either be a compact bone or it is a cancellous bone. Another word for a compact bone is cortical bone and another word for cancellous is trabecular or spongy bone because this one has a lot more holes and this one has a lot less holes so it's compactly tightly packed whereas this one is less packed and therefore it is spongy in nature or in appearance at least. If we forget the shape outer, inner, any kind of shape and we look at the way a bone is formed and how it progresses, how does it start and what is its track, how will it end up, then there are only two ways it can arrive at being a bone and that is called, that process is called ossification, formation of bone and there are two ways, an endochondral ossification and an intramembranous ossification. So a bone may be of an endochondral nature if it arrived in that type of process to become a bone and it may be intramembranous if that's how it developed and got there. The commonest classification we follow which is much much more useful even clinically is the shape-wise six number classification long short flat irregular pneumatic and sesamoid. This shape is very important because that will determine the function which is why we largely across the world adopt this classification. So long bones like the humerus and the femur, flat bones, where are we, where's the name, the name is here, flat bone, 
sternum and scapula and ilium then vertebrae are irregular in shape look at the shape of this it's got some six or seven different pieces which are predictable but they are very irregular you can't call them any one particular shape and then there are short bones which are not long so again a more or less cuboid six surface structure but of a much shorter length which means it doesn't have one dominant axis or one dominant uh, 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 what shall we say uh, um, parameter right in for a long bone the one aspect of it will will be prolonged or dominant or prominent and that that's why we call it a long bone because its length is prominent if it has all the other features of a long bone but it doesn't have a length a notable length then we call it a short bone so it ends up being a cube shaped bone it'll end up having more or less six surfaces we will come to that or it will be a modification of a six surfaced cuboid shape right so our wrist bones and our ankle bones are of that nature one of them is a trapezoid okay then if this is a an exception to the other four and that is that it is actually also a it's a it's a cross between a short bone and a flat bone because it is somewhat flattened but it is having several surfaces and dimensions but we are not naming it according to that we're naming it according to uh, it is not even seed shaped right it's supposed to be sesamoid right sesamoid means seed, seed shape so we we are we are defining sesamoid not so much as seed shape which is what it literally means but we're defining it as a bone which develops in a tendon or a ligament that means it, it is developing within a soft structure entirely surrounded on all sides by a tendinous or ligamentous fibrous soft structure the others don't develop like that the others develop in a, in a different way so if they do this in, embedded in a ligament or a tendon then it is called sesamoid it may not be seed size or shape right and the meaning of sesamoid has changed from size shape to developmentally in a tendon or ligament but we have retained this nomenclature so you must remember that long short flat irregular are shape words and that is the four categories of the shape based classification of bones pneumatic also we can say is a shape word because it is a hollow bone right so those bones which which house your paranasal air sinuses have to be hollow so that the air sinus is inside of it air fills the inside of the bone so such bones are called pneumatic bones it also includes the mastoid which is one part of the temporal bone of the skull these are the pneumatic bones sesamoid bones the word is a shape word but the definition is a location and development definition you just remember it the best known of it is the patella the largest sesamoid bone but we have several in several tendons in several places in very active areas like wrists and ankles you will get little actually seed shaped and seed sized tiny tiny little bones most of them we don't name the only one we have named actually is the patella now if we classify the same bones according to development then we get cartilaginous or membranous bones. We said there could be an endochondral ossification or there could be an intramembranous ossification. So a cartilaginous bone is one which developed in cartilage. That means first there was a cartilage model and then slowly the bone developed within it. So the bone tissue completely replaced the cartilage tissue and that structure which looked the same but of a different material now becomes much better defined bigger and is modeled on that original uh, framework scaffolding of the cartilage which preceded it so development within the cartilaginous model is leading to what are called cartilaginous bones so any any given bone anything you pick up could either be a cartilaginous bone or the other thing it could have been is a membranous bone which means it didn't go through a cartilage model stage it started with the soft tissue in a membrane format and immediately as of one and only step it became bone 
In a cartilaginous bone, there are two steps. You first become cartilage, then you become bone, right? Which is the dominant form of ossification that we have almost all our long bones, even short bones are developing in cartilage. But there are a few which will be developing in membrane also. So they are not equivalent. All long bones are not cartilaginous, right? All flat bones are not membranous. But more or less, that is the way the history proceeds. <coughs> For purpose of classification, the words we use are cartilaginous or membranous. Let's look at long bones a little bit more in detail because they are the majority that we have, right? And they're therefore the majority that will get hurt and come to us as fractures or whatever, injuries or tumors or something like that. So the parts of a long bone, since it's a long linear structure, but it's a basically a cuboid shape, the central bit is called the diaphysis and the edge ends, the ends, upper, lower, proximal, distal, medial, lateral, whichever end of the bone it is, in a, depending on how it is placed in the skeleton. The, the word end of a bone in Greek is epiphysis. So epiphysis is the word for the two ends. Most long bones, the ends are more expanded than the shaft, the center part. So the central part of a long bone is called its shaft in normal English. <coughs> its ends will be its upper and lower end or proximal and distal end or medial and lateral end depending on how it's placed in the body. Most of them, the proximal end is the upper end, the upper end of humerus, the upper end of femur. And the distal end away from the core, away from the center is the lower end. But without using those words, we can just say there is a epiphysis 1 and epiphysis 2 or a proximal epiphysis and a distal epiphysis where the central part shaft or diaphysis meets the epiphysis is a transition zone right is, is an in-between area which is the ending of the shaft and also the ending of the epiphysis right and that is called the metaphysis so a diaphysis is in the middle part of a long bone it is capped on both sides by a metaphysis and that is capped on both sides by an epiphysis. That's another way of looking at it. So the, the broader expanded end of a long bone is called an epiphysis. The place where the diaphysis meets the epiphysis is called a metaphysis. Please remember these words because they come up when we talk about bone growth, bone ossification, bone disease, bone injury, bone healing. Right? So remember these words. The compact bone, we said there are two types, compact and cancellous. Compact bone is found mostly in the shafts of long bones on the outside, the white part, right? So from the surface of the bone for a, a good number of millimeters inward, we'll have thick compact bone. Can you see here? I'll show you again, but in this particular picture, this white bit, there's an actual real bone which has been sliced in a coronal plane, right? And here what they've done, what is to show you that from the surface for a little distance inwards it's completely white you can't see any finer structure at all it's like solid bone right that's why it's called compact bone whereas <coughs> where the epiphysis starts you can see it's full of holes and it seems to be perforated with lots and lots and lots of holes so that is spongy bone or cancellous bone and more, more marrow will be present there. So those holes are filled with another completely different tissue. It's got nothing to do with bone, which is called marrow, right? It is a hematogenous tissue. It is a precursor to the blood in your, flowing in your cardiovascular system. So the bone marrow tissue is housed in the spongy part of your long bones or any, any bones, whichever bones are of a cancellous nature. And also housed in the core of the shaft, which if you follow it further, is a completely hollow area. It's an empty cylindrical space, empty looking when you look at a dry bone. But in life, it is filled with this bone marrow. And if it, the empty cavity is filled with the entire tissue bone marrow, and the cancellous part of the bone is also filled with the same bone marrow, 
a, whether it's in a long bone or a, or a uh, irregular bone or in, in a, a flat bone area. So it, there it doesn't matter about long short shape, right? The spongy cancellous wordings are about the packing of bone material. Therefore, to the naked eye, it will look tightly packed and very, very homogeneous and uniformly white and um, hard. And that is compact bone. And the other one, which is looking much more interrupted with a lot of empty looking spaces, that is called spongy bone. Okay, so compact bone on the outside medullary cavity, spongy bone at the ends. This is how the diaphysis is. And inside the epiphysis, in the center also, again you will have spongy bone. Inside this epiphysis also in the center you will have spongy bone. The surface will be covered with a cartilage which will participate in the joint. And the junction, which is called the metaphysis, will have a, 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 an edge between the compact and the cancellous which is called the epiphyseal plate. Now in the adult, that is a clear line and a fixed thing, that nothing more which, uh, which will happen to it. But in the growing child, this is extremely important, especially in the interpretation of a growing child's bony diseases. So you remember there is something called an epiphyseal plate and tomorrow we'll talk about it when we talk about how ossification happens. So just to explain everything in this particular picture, we have a shaft called the diaphysis, we have the two expanded ends which are called the epiphysis. Plural is S-E-S. -E Epi on top of. Dia means through. Through or in between the two ends. Meta is actually meaning beyond. So this is beyond the shaft. So metaphysis. But if you don't remember the Greek and Latin, it's alright. You have to still remember the terms. Diaphysis, epiphysis and metaphysis are parts of a long bone. In English, we call that the shaft and the two expanded ends. The two ends are the ones usually participating in a joint and they are covered with cartilage. They'll have centers of ossification. What they mean by center is a center of ossification will develop to make these two expanded ends. We will look at what is a center of ossification later. And those centers may develop either as a result of pressure on that point or traction on that point. We will look at that also later. So the bone is pulled and pushed as it grows according to the mechanical pressures which you are putting on it as you emerge from a little soft fetus into a semi-soft uh, newborn baby into a pretty much more solider and stronger crawling infant and by standing and walking and running. You are putting different kinds of mechanical pressure and stimulation on these living tissues called bones and therefore new bumps and surfaces will appear which are called centers of ossification and they may be a pull or a push action in which case we will name the bony parts accordingly. So everything else I think you have understood. Articular cartilage means participating in a joint. Articulum is a joint. Uh, I think everything else in this picture is clear. So this is a picture to further illustrate what it looks like. We have a diaphysis, which is the shaft. We have a metaphysis, which is the junctional zone. And we have a proximal epiphysis, because it's the upper end of this bone, which is attaching it to the core or the axial skeleton. And then you have the hanging free end, which is a distal. So this is called the distal epiphysis. The articular cartilage will be covering the surface, one of the expanded ends. There will be spongy bone in the middle filled with red bone marrow and there will be a line you can see in a cut bone which we are calling the epiphyseal line which is a marker of the epiphyseal plate in life. This is a dead bone which we have cut open in a live bone. That line will be seen in an x-ray right? and it will mark the phenomenon called an epiphyseal plate. We will look at that. So in the shaft itself, you see that there's a solid compact bone in the whole thickness and then there's a whole empty area which is called the medullary cavity or the marrow cavity. On the outside of it, there will be a fibrous tissue called the periosteum just beneath the compact bone and on the inside will be another very thin fibrous layer called the endosteum. And arteries will have to enter through foramina or holes made in the bone where they will keep all this fascinating material alive okay so this is an actual photograph 
a proximal epiphysis, spongy bone at the end of it, metaphysis, a junctional zone, medullary cavity, and compact bone. The markings on a dry bone. It, we showed you a photograph just now, but there will be elevations and there will be depressions and there will be smooth areas and there will be rough areas and there will be rounded areas and they've got so many names. I'm sorry, but you just have to learn them. So elevations on bones can be called a line, something line, some name, line, or a ridge or a crest. More rounded, they may be called a tuber or a tuberosity. In certain places only such an elevation would be called a malleolus. In another place it's called a trochanter. Then sh more, more sharp elevations are called spines or styloid processes. If there is a bone which has a smooth facet surface, a demarcated area which is looking very smooth and well uh, demarcated. <clears throat> they're usually small, but they can be large. If they're small, they're usually very, very smooth. So these are called facets. Then there may be depressions on the surface of a bone. They may be small or large. Small ones, the name we can call them is some fossa, some fovea or some pit. If they're large, we call it a groove or a sulcus or a notch or an incisura. If it's a full hole going into the bone, we call it a foramen or a canal or a meatus. If there are rounded articular areas, they are elevations, but they are fitting into some joint. Articular means joint area. So if there are rounded joint participating areas that could be called the head of a bone or some head or it could be called a condyle, or it could be called a trochlea if it is pulley, which is the wrong spelling, P-U-L-L-E-Y. You know pulley, uh, like where you draw well that little damaru shaped thing, so that if there is a pulley shaped rounded articular area, we call it a trochlea. You'll see there are two or three places named like that. So this is just to familiarize you with the names of the terms which we will use. So a long bone will have a diaphysis, epiphysis and metaphysis. The diaphysis is otherwise what its shaft and includes the central empty space called the medullary cavity. The epiphysis is the end or the projection of the bone and the metaphysis is the junctional zone between. In a flat bone, since it is flat, it won't have ends, right? So we don't use this physis, physis at all. We call it plate. So a, a flat bone will, there'll be one, if, since it is flat, one surface of it will be inside and one surface it will be outside compared to the skeleton. So then we'll call it inner plate and outer plate, right? Or inner surface and outer surface. Or in the case of a scapula, we'd say anterior surface or a posterior surface, depending on its anatomical position. And between the two, there will be a marrow cavity. There will be a cancellous or spongy area with space for marrow. Grooves and depressions can be found on the bone. And then we use words like fossa. Sulcus, for some, if it's it's more, uh, it's not linear, but localized. Sulcus, if it is linear, like like a longer depression. Incisura is if it's sharper. Hiatus is if it's deeper. But don't worry about it. You'll anyway have to mug the names. Just remember these words mean groove or depression. Words for projection. So it could be something process. It could be spine. Hamulus is a hook shaped or a hammer shaped actually, but ham hook shaped projection. Cornu is a corner, sharper projection. Tuberosity, tubercle, trochanter, crest, epicondyle. These are all words for projections from bones. If there is a pit, a hole going into the bone, the name we give is foramen or aperture or fovea of fenestra or fissure. If it is a flat part of a bone, we'll call it a lamina or a squama, right? If it is the joint participating part of the bone with a smooth surface, then we'll call it a facet, sometimes a condyle or a trochlea, but facet is only used if it is articulating with some other facet of some other bone, therefore forming a joint. Right? We don't use that word facet otherwise, unless it's part of a joint. Then, if there are projections 
I'll just take two minutes and then we'll stop this section. So the projections from the bones are going to be called epiphyses. We already saw that, right? So the epiphyses, how it got formed, will determine the names that we give it. So there are types of epiphyses, some which are formed because of pressure being put on that part of the bone before it had fully ossified, when it was still in its cartilaginous model. So the head of humerus is one of the examples. Attraction epiphysis is something was attached to it, something strong, which was pulling on it in the normal mechanics of the body as it was being formed. And that one word example is greater trochanter of the femur is a traction epiphysis because something attached to this this part of the developing bone was pulling on it so that pull the mechanical pull made more ossification happen in that direction and ended up in being a projection which we are calling a epiphysis and atavistic is a very interesting word it means that it is redundant or it's regressive in terms of evolution it has it no longer has any use. It was very useful in a lower animal, in the evolutionary tree. But now, in the adult, in, in the adult human, it has no function that we can understand. So the corocoid spurpus of the scapula is called an atavistic epiphysis because it's, to our best understanding, it doesn't have any mechanical advantage being offered for the functions of, the, of that bone in, in this particular species. In earlier species, it was useful or very clearly had some function. In us, it's there, we've named it, we've got all kinds of um, terminology, but we don't know what it does. So that's called an atavistic epiphysis. Bone cells are live. It's a live tissue, never ever forget. Because once when we teach you osteology, we will be carrying that humerus, somebody's femur and walking around the place. You, it's very easy to forget. It looks like a stick, right? It's very easy to forget this was alive and responsive and sensitive. And therefore, when it gets hurt in your patient, it you then the liveness of it comes home to you. I, I hope, I'm sure some of you at least have suffered fractures, bone injuries. You know how alive your bones are because of the pain they cause. But remember the names of the cells and then we'll go into details when we do the histology. There are osteogenic cells which give rise to the bone which give rise to mother cells called osteoblasts, which give rise to osteocytes, and another lineage of cells called osteoclasts. Osteo means is the word used for anything to do with bone, right? And we will come to those subsets later when we do histology. This I wanted to demonstrate to you that there is live cells, but they are all in a space or in a base called a matrix, and that tissue, soft tissue, is fully mineralized, which is why the skeletal system is specialized. It's the only mineralized tissue that we have. But if we are somehow able to demineralize with a, a dilute acid, you can dip a bone into dilute acid over a period of time and you pull it out, it is soft tissue. This is just to illustrate to you that it's not only calcium phosphate or hydroxyapatite or whatever the chemical it is. There is a whole bunch of organic material with live cells in it which are constituting the bone. So this is what the architecture of it looks like. I'm sure you've studied this and we will tell you the details later. So we know that the base of it is an osteon or a set of concentric lamellae of mineralized matrix which are surrounding linear longitudinal channel-like areas which are formed or secreted or created by those cells, those osteoblasts, right? And they are all kept alive by very, very, very fine interconnected channels in which very, very fine blood vessels run. So keeping each of those osteocytes alive in its little space, which is called a lacuna, is a whole bunch network of very, very fine vessels. So we are only showing you the core vessel. This one would have given one branch to this and some branches to this and some branches to this. Then these little dark things is the area where the cell is sitting and it's alive and it's capable of secreting matrix and of responding to pressure, to traction, to this, that and the other. So this osteon kind of system we will talk about in more detail again in histology. But this is just to give you an idea, in compact bone, this osteon-like system is very tightly packed together. In cancellous bone, each of these is a bar 
of bone separated by long long spaces within that bar again there are few osteons but not so tightly packed together and th this core tightly packed together cylindrical osteons is the classic architecture of long bones this is another picture very pretty pictures we have in our atlases please open them and start reading them i'm not giving you the details right now because already there's a load information overload today but please start looking at your books and start familiarizing yourself with the terminology this is what it looks like in a fresh round, um, ts transverse section through the bone when you look at it under a microscope and this is a higher magnification it looks exactly how we drew it isn't it this is a space which was occupied by a live cell these are spaces very very fine feathery spaces which were traversed by very, very fine blood vessels. And if you look at a long neutrinal section of it, you see that that's where the vessel ran and that's how its branches got up, met up with each other and made a network. If you look at spongy bone, any one bar of bone is called a trabecula. We talked about that word just now. Trabecula is a, a longitudinal, usually cylindrical kind of a structure or projection, right? So this trabecula, me meeting up with that trabecula and in between the empty spot empty spaces are full of bone marrow but if you look at any one trabecula and cut it open in that there will be one surrounding of osteoblasts then there will be mineralized matrix then a few cells which look trapped in between these which are alive which are the ones secreting the matrix in the first place so they secrete the matrix all around them and then they get trapped in between because that matrix now becomes mineralized and once it's mineralized this thing can't move but it stays connected through this fine network of channels in which the blood vessels run. Just wanted to bring it alive to you. This is a neonate. A neonate is newborn. Newborn's live x-ray arm. Just showing you that this is a long bone. And then there seems to be a gap. That's a joint space. And then there are two long bones. And again, there's a big gap. And we don't see the wrist bones at all because they haven't started getting ossified yet. Only ossified tissue will block the x-rays and give you a shadow on the film so your your metacarpals and your phalanges bones are short long bones right they are all in place but your short bones which are your wrist bones haven't started working out yet they have to, they're not there it doesn't mean they're not there it means their base model cartilage model is there but the ossification has not started yet so ossification from the primary centers is well advanced except in the carpels this is the actual fetus structure when you look at it with your live with your eyes naked eyes it looks pretty solid right but if you look at it through the x-ray some parts of it are not solid yet this whole wrist area is not ossified yet this is an actual section through an ossifying wrist palm and hand they took a section through it to show you what the cartilaginous models are looking at and this cartilage model is from here to here in the middle of it, the bone model has started. It is growing in from the center towards the two ends and it is replacing the tissue, the base tissue. We'll come back to this when we talk about ossification. Just wanted to share some lovely pictures with you about how we got to know what we know. It's because we've done so much of hard work in slicing it and dicing it and staining it and putting it on the microscope, doing all kinds of experiments on it. That's how you're standing on the shoulders of giants and you will hopefully take the whole science forward and do brilliant things with it. All right, we'll talk about the ossifications later in the next class because we are already running late. I will stop this here. Tomorrow, same time, we will go more into detail, uh, starting with the uh, histology, the, the, the microstructure and how growth and healing and repair progresses. Okay, thank you for now. I'll see you tomorrow.